Pathological slash extreme slash rational demand of audience reviewing and refining is contested terrain through an educational perspective. Uh, Frontiers in Education, PDA Special Issue by uh, Mr. Richard Woods, a uh, London South Bank University PhD student. Um, this is just a short video to give a quick guide over what I and others are expecting in an edited special issue on PDA. Um, more specifically, detailing that there is um ongoing historical debates around pda so yeah um a bit about me i am autistic i'm a elizabeth Dinkins pda profile i'm not emotionally attached to it um yeah i actively reflect on how my values um shape my understandings and construction of pda as a construct um and my agenda is for at least increase of quality scientific method-based research and practice um this is my interpretation of the pda literature others may disagree um so i do have a couple a few conflicts of interest such as i am developing various pda tools um i do derive some income from different pda training sessions and i do reluctantly advocate for pda as a standalone diagnostic entity or construct or syndrome or disorder depending on how you want to view it um so a bit of introduction of of this quick video so um i and others had an application for a special issue on pda accepted in frontiers in education so that's i myself dr sorry professor eddie chaplin and dr alison moore it is in um frontiers education um which belongs to the frontiers kind of journal group and they have clear rules for accepting articles as part of the, like, the peer review process um so yeah i'm gonna mention how kind of these and views didn't really change over time in relation towards PDA being part of the autism spectrum. Um, yeah, there's quickly no consensus over what PDA is or what features associated with PDA, and that some have kind of prematurely viewed PDA to be a profile of autism in the UK. And I'm going to detail, um, loosely detail, um, the ongoing historical debates around PDA, mainly drawn upon specific examples from the literature. Um, I'm not doing a, a comprehensive literature review on here. I've just given examples to show that there is there are ongoing debates around PDA um so and it's for that reason that um it, it's for the reason why this is not a comprehensive lit review it's one reason why I'm saying that this video will not cover the education debates around PDA um but I will be quite clear about the type of submissions that we will be welcoming um so yeah um type of submissions will be welcome to be systematic in scope and review to kind of novel conceptualizations of pda uh, refinement of proposed ontologies of pda such as like is it a form of attachment disorder um contextual opinion historical and current notions of disability questioning uh, the underlying assumptions and providing alternative explanations um the ethical merits for different worldviews of pda and personal perspectives on PDA and how do PDA strategies compare with other approaches um, used with, with special education needs disability persons and wider pedagogies. So yeah, um, well, the main PDA discourse is pretty much that it's called pathological demand avoidance or extreme demand avoidance. Uh, it was originally pervasive mental disorder, uh, presently rare autism profile subgroup or subtype, and it has unique strategies that are different from um, autism. Um, Currently in the UK, some conditions are diagnosing PDA as a profile of autism spectrum disorder. Um, some researchers are researching PDA from their own understandings of autism, and, and caregivers are often highly motivated to take part in research. Um, the interest in the concept of PDA largely centres in the UK, and it is at present a culture-bound concept. Um, it's recognised that in the UK, interest in PDA has sharply risen over the last 10 years, and that that this interest substantially outstrips its um, research base and also due to campaigning efforts um, by per, um, people can be able to look out for PDA and this is a source of bias. Um, yeah, PDA is definitely controversial and this is noted in the literature uh, and also more recently there have been kind of um, reviews of PDA evidence base and of expert opinion by uh, our clinical practice in the UK and um, a recent systematic review so um, the systematic review is Kedal et al. NICE stands for the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and that's the main arbitrary clinical practice in the UK. That's the British Psychological Society, and that's the Royal College of Psychiatry. Yeah, of psychiatry. So, yeah, there are three other main schools of thought of PDA in the literature. So, that's PDA is basically rebranded autism, and I'll cover that later. PDA is a pseudo syndrome or pseudo disorder, and that PDA is a common mental disorder. So, um, I'm going to briefly cover the um perspectives of uh, clinical offices of 
practice in the UK. So first covering NICE. Um, so in NICE has three um, clinical guidelines for autism. Um, so there's one for diagnosing autism in uh, under 18s um, and there's one for working with uh, under with autistic people under 18s and there is a third guide which is for diagnosing and working with autistic adults. Um, so yeah, PDA is only mentioned in one of those guides, and that's for um, diagnosing children. So diagnosing autism in children, uh, which is uh, CG one two eight. So um, it states this about PDA. So I'm not going to read out all the quotes in this, um, on these sides because I just don't have time. But what I will point out is interesting things. So uh, it mentions a brief about what PDA is and how it's some of you it's being autism. Um, obviously mentioned about. Um, Striking feature is it's kind of refusal to comply with its excessive demands. Um, and I've highlighted here that oppositional uh, the this oppositional behaviour can also be described as option as oppositional defiant disorder. Um, I find this quite quite interesting because it suggests that um the the avoidance of others' demands is kind of done by choice. Um. So, more recently, NICE reviewed um, the evidence for autism um, and they reviewed kind of the evidence around PDA, mainly because some people kind of requested it. Um, and what NICE said is that um, PDA is not included uh, in the main diagnostic manuals. There's no consensus over what it is, and they didn't identify any new evidence of note to warrant changing that description, basically. Um, yeah, they also said um, the clinical opinion on it is very mixed over what PDA is or if it's a distinct anything. Um, and again, they're saying the same point, but in less terms here. And um, the bottom is that we did not identify suitable evidence on the possible links with anorexia or pathological mind avoidance that supported external feedback received. Um, and this is, again, just a, a more full-on quote from the nice review of the PDA evidence. Um, again, this group remains about whether pathological mind avoidance should be recognised as a distinct diagnosis. Some type of experts considered the appropriate recognition of coexisting conditions and individualised management strategies are sufficient. Um, again, because I didn't, I didn't find any evidence in this area, it's not been, it's just not, they're not acting on the external feedback. Um, so this is the Royal College of Psychiatrists um, view on PDA. So uh, again, recognise it's not, in any diagnostic manuals, um, it's quite a lot of controversy. Um, the mild avoidance itself as a characteristic is quite widespread in human population. Um, and they have these four kind of traits around PDA. Um, I find these quite interesting because they do not mention social communication issues. Um, but moving on to the second half of the Royal College Psychiatry's um views and pda they um so there's a debate whether or not if it's a form of autism if it's specific to autism if it's seen in other conditions or if it's conditions own right um they talk about um the challenges difficulties that those with pda and their caregivers often face um and talk about ideal ways how you could kind of um manage it uh, as part of kind of clinical formulation so yeah um this is the british psychological society's views and pda when they reviewed it um Again, they basically uh, said there's no evidence to say what PDA is. They kind of refer to a couple of screening tools and diagnostic tools. Um, they said it's controversial here. Um, and there's debate whether or not it's specific to autism, um, if it's seen other kind of group in other kind of conditions or not um, around here. So, yeah, um, just basically highlighting the independent answers of clinical practice are being quite neutral on PDA and equally favouring divergent opinions on it. Uh, I'm moving on to Newton's views on PDA and she was quite consistent that PDA is not a form of autism. Um, so this is a quick quote from her first publication in 1983 on PDA. So she talks about how her referral pattern um, influenced her, her basically discovering PDA, but she's quite clear at the end that these uh, those children with PDA are not autistic. And 20 years later, in her published peer review article, she's making similar comments. So um, she's saying here that she excluded um, children and persons who were showing kind of autistic features from her um, cohort, from her data, research database. Here she's talking about how PDA has to be different to uh, basically the autism spectrum, which she viewed to be autism and Asperger's syndrome. So that would be autistic disorder. So um, 
And here it's just quite clearly saying that PDA is a pervasive disorder and it's not part of the autism spectrum. It would be state to view it as a form of autism. And there are other quotes and reasons in the PDA, in Newton's scholarship to kind of support the position that she quite clearly did not view PDA to be part of the autism spectrum. Um, or that people with PDA are autistic, but that's a... Um, <clears throat> we're kind of moving on to the other schools of thought on PDA now. So this is kind of rebranded autism. So what I mean here is that PDA represents um, characteristics of people which are not typically pathologized by an autism diagnosis. So hence why it's rebranded autism. So um, these are first two points, so a couple of quotes from Critics 2007 and Mills 2017 referring to um, William Gould's views in 2002 that PDA is not a separate syndrome and that the features are found throughout the entire autistic population. Um, but they do recognise that it's a uh, um that the research is kind of innovative and can be clinically valuable. Um and yeah, this is just uh this is from the editorial Christie 2007. Uh so there's basically saying that there's a debate whether or not PDA is a separate syndrome or its features are found throughout the entire population, and it may also be a female form of of autism down here. Um and again, kind of again similar quotes. So this is from Gordon Asher Smith saying that um, asking if PDA could be um, a female presentation of autism or there could be other similar presentations. Uh, this is Damian Milton taking a more critical autism studies perspective, suggesting that PDA represents a pathologization of um, behaviours that autistic people um, express to a certain sort of agency. Um, and down here, this is a quote from a recent study from White Tell, which basically says that. Um, present there's no real justification for viewing PDA as a separate thing or subdivision of autism and that kind of um, anecdotal claims by clinicians um, that PDA is a separate thing is not being supported by research evidence um, I would question why are the clinicians stating that then I would probably raise concerns about bias but I'm probably going off the tangent there um, so this is just a diagram by Alison Moore from her, in her critical autism studies kind of conference talk and how she, how she conceptualizes PDA um, She's talking about PDA represents intersection between childhood, autism, and gender. Um, and kind of again hinges back at their point about PDA being viewed as a female form of autism. Um, but moving on to the next school of thought, which is talking, which is that PDA is not a real disorder or syndrome or diagnostic entity. It's um, that its features can be attributed to kind of accepted kind of difficulties or disorders. So this goes back from. Um, this is a quote by Alan Geralda in 2003, which basically states that the features described in Newton's research um, can be attributed towards accepted um, diagnoses such as kind of ADHD, obsessive defiant disorder, um, or kind of anxiety disorder, or social anxiety disorder. Um, and going down here, this is a quote by Wingertel, which basically says that um, features of PDA may be caused by something which is not autism that might be um that might have like psychopathic tendencies basically um so moving on so this is kind of more highlights so this is from the abstract of green as hell 2018 um a and they're basically talking about how um that the term of pda highlights an important range of kind of current occur occurring difficulties for many children um with with autism spectrum disorder that can substantially affect, affect families they basically um, say that PDA should be viewed as having these kind of um, characteristics. PDA should be viewed as belonging to kind of accepted conditions, and that's how it should be kind of formulated as part of clinical assessment. Um, down here, this is um, authors of recent research into PDA suggesting that um, our results are therefore in agreement with the authors who question the validity of PDA as a distinct entity, i.e., Green and Cell 2008. Um, so, what I'm trying to do as part of this video is to show that there there is historic um kind of critique of PDA and different ways of viewing it and that this debate is still ongoing um and i'm now drawn upon recent literature on the topic um so this is a model for viewing pdas having features of accepted kind of categories from, from this Ion's 2013 thesis so she, here she's got kind of callous emotional traits conduct problems uh hyperactivity and attention emotional symptoms or anxiety and kind of autism features and when they all overlap that's kind of newton's pda concept um here so moving on this is a more recent one from richard soppert in his 
um, book Trapped on PDA. So, um, yeah, so he's got kind of um, autism here, ADHD here, um, obsessive defiance disorder or content disorder here, and kind of defense of trauma. Where they overlap, that represents PDA, um, in, in his view. Um, yeah, so that's the last part of this view. So, um, what I'm doing here in the next one is I'm discussing how PDA can be viewed as a common mental disorder, but um, I'm specifically doing this in two areas. One by mentioning the kind of debate that PDA might be a form of attachment disorder, but also mentioning kind of some of the evidence that PDA is seen in autistic people. So um, the first point is to recognise, this is a quote that I've given previously from Phil Christie's 2007 article, but um, I'm pointing out here that there's debate, but if PDA could be viewed as a form of attachment disorder or personality disorder here, and this is more a kind of full-on quote from in a short piece in the Psychologist by the British from the British Psychological Society um, by Rebecca McElroy, asking basically noting that that PDA features can be seen in those with attachment disorder, and that it is reasonable to assume that PDA um, basically may exist um, in attachment disorders or ha uh, has significant overlap with it. Um, so again, other kind of quotes suggests so. This is from David Milton's kind of book chapter on PDA. So it's noticed that PDA, um, what there should be resistance to it as being um, a false form of attachment disorder um, rather than being having any neurological basis. And this is a quote from Damien Milton is noting that there's not enough evidence to suggest that PDA um, is rooted into kind of neurological basis so, um, and that it might be caused from trauma, essentially. Um, so he also suggests it might be potentially negligent to assume that PDA is not caused by trauma, which is not really discussed much. And this is, again, a quote from Flack Hill Hotel, noting that some might view PDA to be a form of attachment disorder. Um, I also kind of mentioned a quote for saying that people might view PDA to be part of the autism spectrum. So, um, yeah, um, so this is me basically pointing out that people are kind of noting that not all of Newton's cohort, um, not not all of Newton's PDA cases were autistic. So, i.e., there are non-autistic people with PDA in Newton's research. So the first two quotes are basically just from Newton herself, um, saying that they're not autistic and that she's excluded those with kind of autism features. Um, these are more recently kind of a couple of kind of clinicians noting that um, that not all of Newton's cohort would um are autistic and therefore there are non-autistic people in there. The latter point is is my comment on 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 those kind of quotes and this is me kind of more presenting some of the case that PDA is seen in autistic people so this is a quote from Dan Goody um that basically uh, a massive a manipulative child in the 1970s might receive the label of PDA um in the 2000s um this is me kind of mentioning the one person with attachment disorder and adult score of one in his own thesis and Again, in her chapter eight study, there's 23% of children diagnosed with PDA are non-autistic. Um, and this is literally taken from Riley Tell's um, abstract. So four of them, um, so there's four case studies in this um, article, and they uh, met threshold for a range of kind of uh, range of categories, but um, only three of them met the criteria for autism. So therefore, one of them is not autistic, and this is noted in the article itself. Um, uh, this is a conference. Um, this is research in a conference paper, and it states out of um, eight out of out eight out of the eleven kind of children, young persons with PDA are non-autistic. Um, and yeah, this is a quote again from the Greenatel abstract where they. They say PDA or extreme demand avoidance to terms sometimes apply to complex behaviours of children with, uh, within or beyond the autism spectrum. So basically, um, in non-autistic people there, and this is again another study which is um, saying that seven out of twenty-four people, uh, children with PDA in this um, sample are non-autistic. <coughs> um, so yeah, um, so why am I making this video, um, making this recording? And there's good reasons for that because. Uh, one of the uh, the frontiers, as, uh, as I said previously, has quite clear guidelines for accepting submissions, and one of those is in relation towards literature review. So um, I'm, I'm doing this to uh, help potential authors into it to go um, 
to point out to him that there is uh, ongoing historical debates. Um, you can obviously interpret those debates in your own way. Um, but the, but um, so yeah, so submissions should recognise there is no agreement over what PDA is, and they should recognise that there, there's no agreement over what features are associated with PDA. Again, that PDA is controversial, um, and they should definitely discuss um, the different ongoing historical debates about PDA in their own uh, in their own in their own interpretation of it, and they should situate um, or contextualise their research in these ongoing historical debates. Um, I think that's quite important to kind of state that. So, yeah, um, Frontiers in Education does have article processing charges, and that they're expected to be paid within thirty days of an article being accepted. Um, due to that, uh, Frontiers does have a fund for offers can apply for. Um, obviously, us editors are not involved with that fund, and um, you can find out information about this fund from um this link below. Um, I'll be quite clear about that because a lot of people with lived experience of PDA are likely to um have income issues. So I'm trying to be inclusive of potential kind of um contributors. Um, this is a side I've seen before, but this is just restating the types of submissions we are encouraging so systematic or scope and reviews and novel conceptualizations of pda refinement of proposed ontologies such as pda as a form of attachment disorder conceptualizing pda in sorry, in, sorry contextualizing pda in historical and current notes of disability questioning questioning pda's underlying assumptions and providing alternative explanations and uh, basically setting out the ethical merits of different worldviews on pda and um this personal perspectives on pda i think are quite important and Again, how do you kind of um, PDA strategies compare with other approaches used with special education needs and disability persons and wider pedagogies? Um, with mask that. So, um, yeah, this is a conclusion. So, um, yeah, uh, authors submitting into the special issue need to kind of clarify what school of thought they're basing their axiology upon, um, their definition. Uh, what the specific definition of PDA is, what is that behaviour profile they're using, particularly the kind of wording as different versions have different kind of clinical, clinical interpretations and what their uh, diagnostic threshold for PDA is. Um, so these are my contact details and this is a link for the information for the special issue itself. And I'm just going to go through the references after this. Um, so just the first reference slide. I'm only going to be in a these slides for a few seconds because you should be able to pause them. Um, again, likewise, the kind of previous slides with the quotes on. Um, but I am making these slides publicly available so um, people can e uh, for ease of access and ease of kind of accessing the quotes. Um, so, yeah, we come to the end of this video and I hope it's been informative and useful to you. Um, so, yeah, and that's it. So, thank you and uh, hope to you submit into the special issue. Okay, thank you. Bye.